Good morning. Welcome again, Bethany Social Reform Presbyterian Church, as we gather together here for our Wednesday morning. I forgot what day of the week it was. Wednesday morning uh, devotion time. We take requests to explain further parts of the Bible, words in the Bible, phrases in the Bible, uh, things that are hard to understand that we might better serve our Lord Jesus Christ in knowing the truth and his way of working. So today, the request has come that we look at the Onan passage in Genesis 38, which is one of the stranger passages in the Bible, but it doesn't need to be. It's pretty straightforward, pretty clear in what it is teaching. Uh, it's just one of them things that makes us a little uncomfortable, so we don't know how to handle it. But today, we're going to explain it a little bit more, help us understand again the bigger picture, and understand why God brought judgment in this case. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for this morning, uh, for this day, and for the glory of your name. We pray that you would bless us and keep us, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to receive your truth, that you might in every way be our God, and that we might be your people out of love and of grace. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this morning we turn here to Genesis 38, uh, this story that begins uh, with uh, the death of a man, but it also begins with a strange interaction in the family of Judah. Let's go ahead and read here the uh, first uh, 10 verses. It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there was a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son and called his name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bore a son and called his name Shelah. He was at Chezeb when she bore him. Then Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. And Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and marry her, and raise up an heir to your brother. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his, and it came to pass when he went in to his brother's wife that he omitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother, and the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. Amen. So, this is the basic story of Onan in Genesis 38. It begins, as it often does in the Bible, with Judah disobeying the Lord. Things are very clear in the scriptures. Who are the Jews in the Old Covenant to get married to? They are not to marry Canaanites. They're not to marry Egyptians. They are to marry within the covenant community. And Paul makes it clear in 2 Corinthians that that has not ceased in the New Covenant. Christians are to marry Christians. Christians are to marry believers. And the main purpose of that is to raise up godly seed unto the Lord, children of the covenant, so that the covenant community not only maintains, but flourishes through ordinary means. You know, we often joke that babies born here uh, are an example of Presbyterian church growth. And there's truth to that. And what God is condemning Judah here for is his failure to maintain the law as God had given it to him. And so, as you might imagine, the firstborn son of this union is wicked, and the Lord kills him. However, we know from later, later on in the Bible that uh, there is a thing called leveret marriage, where there's a kinsman redeemer. And the idea here is, is that the line of the firstborn must be maintained and continued. Now, there are spiritual reasons for this. Consider again what the promise will be made to Judah in Judah 49, or in Genesis 49. That out of Judah would come the king. And so what has the firstborn son destroyed of himself? He could have been in the lineage of Christ, but he chose the wicked things of the world. And then we have the brother come, uh, the second born, whose name is Onan. And we hear uh, that Judah comes to his son Onan and says, hey, it is your responsibility as a second born to maintain the line, to maintain your brother's name, go into your brother's wife, conceive, and bear his son. Now, 
Again, this sounds strange to us because we don't do things like this anymore. This is one of them ceremonial laws in the Old Testament that has passed away. If your older brother dies, you are not required to marry his wife. But in the Old Covenant, it was the case. And Onan does the first part. He marries his brother's wife, and yet he refuses to bear a child for his brother. Now, there is witness here again to the wickedness of the heart of Onan that he does not want to see his brother flourish, so he refuses to do his duty. Now, the concept here is shown forth in beautiful fashion, of course, in the book of Ruth. But remember, even in the book of Ruth, the first one does not take his role seriously. Remember, Ruth's husband dies, as they go back into the land, Naomi seeks kinsmen by which they can be taken care of. And as the kinsmen are being sought after, they run into Boaz. Boaz goes to the elders, tells them what's going on. The elders say, hey, isn't there another one? Boaz says, yes. They go to him. And what do they discover? They discover that the first of the kinsmen refuses to do his duty. He is shamed by Ruth. And Boaz, being the second in line, then becomes the heir. And Boaz provides seed, and they bear a child. And that child is in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a son of Judah. And he bears, again, this promise that was made in Genesis 3.15 that God would provide a man from the seed of the woman. Onan here, in refusing to do his duty, is not just disobeying his father, Judah. He's not only wasting the gift that God's given him, but he's also dishonored the wife of his brother. But even more important than that, he's a covenant breaker. He could have had the blessings of being named in Matthew chapter 1 or Luke chapter 4, 3, but instead... He chooses vainglory and is destroyed. And that's what this passage is all about. Again, understanding that we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have been given a responsibility to maintain and witness to the covenant promises of Jesus Christ. And in refusing to do so, should we be surprised if we receive a different judgment than what Onan has received? So again, these passages might sound strange, and they do sound strange. We need to be honest about that because we don't live like this anymore. But we need to see that God here is judging Onan because of his lack of understanding of the covenant blessing. Now, whose fault is that that Onan doesn't understand this? Again, it goes back to Judah. Judah, who should not have been marrying Canaanite women, has obviously not raised his son up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and he's receiving the consequences of it. Now, the whole rest of this chapter is worth looking at because it's just one of the most bizarre chapters in the Bible, and we might might do that uh, later. But this morning, again, we've taken a look at this passage concerning Onan in Genesis 38, seeing again that the problem here is not so much the spilling of the seed. The problem here is Onan has failed to maintain the line of his brother, which is required in the law of God, not for Onan's sake, not even for his brother's sake, but for the wider covenant community's blessing. And so sometimes we need to remind ourselves that our sin has much greater consequences than merely ruining our relationship with Jesus. Sin always brings the covenant community into disrepute. Again, the name which is above every name should be a concern of ours as we obey the law of God. We should think, well, how is this going to make my family look? How is this going to make the church look? How is this going to make God look? If we, especially if you're an open and loud believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you better back it up with obedience because the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And the greater the judgment is against those in the covenant community rather than those outside the covenant community. And that's, again, one of the lessons here in Genesis 38. So again, we've touched on the nature of Onan's sin, why these things had to happen in the first place with Onan, and really why 
Onan, at some level, is not at fault because his father has failed to maintain what God required, not just in the Old Testament, uh, but by his perfect and holy word. So again, we give thanks again for God's grace and providing us examples in the scriptures, negative ones, even if they might be a little uncouth for our 2024 eyes and ears. So may the Lord bless you today. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. Take care and God bless.